بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي عمري وحل الأكتة من لساني يفقه كودي It's an honor to be standing in front of you all and being part of this uh, seminar. Uh, some of you might know I'm a product of this institution you see around you, all the way down from that nursery school, all the way up to this high school and the college where I was part of the board at one time as well. And I'm extremely humbled to be standing in front of my teacher here who taught me the first lesson in Islamic finance. And his inspiration and enthusiasm pushed me to dig deeper and learn more about Islamic finance. What I'm here to present to you today is a much bigger picture about Islamic finance. And when we say Islamic economics to say per se, it's more about the holistic approach about being a Muslim and handling money. Okay? So before I touch what Islam tells us to do, I would like us to reflect, most of you might know already, what economics is. But I'll just brush on that and what modern economics is doing, has been doing, and will continue to do if we don't make a stop to it. So the drive of economics is triggered by the needs and wants. Yeah? I need this, I need a roof over my head, or I want a mansion. Depending on what your need or want is, it will drive you to either work hard or do business in a certain way so that you can prosper or achieve that need or want. But there is a conflict to that. There is a problem associated with that. And that problem is that because all whatever you need, they are very limited. There are just very few of those. And if there are few of those, what will happen is what we heard earlier about pricing, about the demand and the supply being pushing or creating a price. If more people start demanding something, on creating it as a want and not as a need, the price of that item will automatically go up. Right or wrong? And that scarcity is what is the core issue or core drive which is coming about with economics. And if we try to mitigate that, there are certain players which we'll talk about shortly that how those things are actually becoming the problem. First, it's the goods or service. Do I really need it? Do I need to produce it? How much is it being produced? How much is being produced? And if those produced, if they are being produced, are they enough to cater for whatever the requirement is? Is it more or is it less? Most of the times you see there's a shop stocked up with a lot of goods or a factory has got a warehouse filled with goods presumpting or preempting that at a future date there will be a demand coming in or I will create a deficit somewhere so that demand is created and then to price to go up. Is that fair or not? Scarcity is the bigger problem with every place we look at and that scarcity is in these four factors of production. Your people your money, your business, and your land. These four items are the ones which drive an economy. So if your land is scarce, there is very little limited land which we can cultivate on. The production of that cap of that, from that land will be limited or will be more. Vis-a-vis, -vis, if the capital is more or less, it's going to trigger it in that way. And if they're businessmen doing the right thing in the right way, yes, we'll benefit all. But if they're not doing it in the right way, and they're following this specific model here, which is going to be associating with interest, wherever um, the amount of funds are being delivered, 
they are associated with interest or that fund being associated or represented as a commodity itself on its own capacity, all right, will trigger interest. That income automatically starts to diminish and create a disease which I will explain to you about shortly. So what are the outcomes eventually from this economic processes? Your debt will start increasing. You will start having an oversupply. You will start having a lot of competition. Too many people starting to do the same job because everybody thinks that it's a lucrative business. Okay? There will not be diversification. The production of that item will going to explode. It's going to create so much of that item that it's going to start becoming surplus, eventually the price going down, okay? There is overutilization. Everybody has started to drive a car in Mombasa. Mombasa was a very small town. I know what you guys experienced a, week, a couple of uh, days back. Because of the number of cars, it created chaos. Everybody wants to have that want, having that comfort. And automatically, within that comfort, you start having wastage. How much time was wasted, time itself on its own, was wasted in that traffic? That is value. That value was lost. It all evolves around the typical integral systems. And these integral systems are associated with the, with the laws which we have, which we govern, which govern us. Uh, CEO Mr. Hussain, uh, Dr. Hussain just mentioned about that we do not have that freedom within the Islamic finance systems to buy law, to interpret or to do business the way we are prescribed to do. Yeah? So these laws and the economic laws of uh, the vicious circle of poverty and the likes, automatically they have really struggled or kept the poor poorer and the rich getting more richer. All the way from the moment the seed is planted into that land, all the way to where it is produced into a chapati or a cake and put on your table. Every element, because of it being scarce, because of it being governed by that system, economic system, it has started to disintegrate. The question then comes in, that food on your plate, which has been processed all the way from farm to the fork, is it halal? Is it fair? Was every person in that system Acted, did he act justly or was he acted on justly? Was the, was the farmer given the right due what he was supposed to be given or was he not? Did the farmer go and borrow from, an, from, from a conventional bank? Is his equipment in riba? Where do we start? Where do we start? Coming down to the economic, Islamic economic system, where Islamic economic system is all about. It's not about money or Islamic banking only. It involves every moment of your life from start to the end, how you have managed it. Whether you received an inheritance, whether you received it in business, whether you gave it in sadaqah, whether you gave it in zakah, or whether you did a work for it. All that is involved. Apart from that, it also involves how did you mitigate your risk? Did you use, uh, did you transfer your risk or you shared your risk? All right? Uh, the people with insurance would be very well aware of that within the conventional insurance system, you actually transfer the risk, but you do not share it. Under Islamic finance and takaful systems, you share the risk, you do not transfer it. And those details, uh, Wa mentioned within the Sharia contracts, which are not only for banking, but all Islamic finance contracts. Again, I repeat what uh, Dr. Hussein mentioned, that those were trade, and those trade contracts being associated in the principles of finance. So in my under understanding and interpretation, which I would like to share with you, is that Islamic banking is not a bank per se, but it's a business, all right? It's trading for you or on your behalf. And in that case, when it does that, it has every right to make sure that their people are catered for. They also are working for you and they need to be serviced as well. 
So when we look at this Islamic economics, it's more of a social science, creating a social fabric. We are all human beings. We are all equal. However, we differentiate ourselves within the amount of wealth we have acquired. And within that wealth, we are supposed to, and I repeat myself, supposed to create this human fabric to create Islamic economics. So for that reason, we have been prescribed of the two and a half percent of zakat, which is compulsory on us, where applicable or who is eligible. If not, that's a different story. But for those who are eligible, automatically that becomes a compulsory item on us. And if we all do that religiously, diligently, I don't think it will be so difficult to break that vicious circle of poverty. So what is the objective of Islamic economics? It is to create a fair and free distribution of wealth. It is to avoid accumulation and amassing of wealth. It is to create the rightful uh, distribution of opportunities amongst people, not to make it selfish. The objective is to reduce selfishness and to create more fairness amongst humans. We are all brothers and sisters sitting around this, in this room. But unfortunately, it becomes so difficult that we differentiate ourselves by status, class, skin, race, etc. Well, we were told, according to Ummah, that we are all one Ummah. We are not different. We are not different. And we create that differentiation and segregate in ourselves. But now, the time has come to think about changing that. Islamic economics within, whereas we will look forward and in depth into it, it is actually to give that right so that everybody becomes accessible and being, uh, being acted upon very fairly, ensure you have enough security amongst your brethren, okay, and pro prohibit all antisocial institutions. So institutions whereby where our iman is going to be affected, where our trade will be affected, where our thought processes will be affected. All those need to be reduced from our system, including those beautiful gadgets we have on our table today. Wherever they are distracting us, we need to stay away from them. So, where do we land on? Where does it come out from? Islamic economics is part, or Islamic finance is part of the bigger picture of Islamic economics whereby derived from the, the Quran, the Hadith, the Ijma, and the Ijtihad. According to the Ijma and Ijtihad, I'm not a Sharia scholar, I'm not a Mufti, so I'll not dig deeper into that. But each one, to my little bit of understanding, not all of them are prescribed at one time. They are as per situation, okay? All that reflects to the moral values. And I will look at the moral values versus the materialistic values shortly. The moral values being the piety, equality, brotherhood, justice, benevolence, and cooperation. If we all together started stand up today and we mentioned or we repeat what Brother Shabir just mentioned a while ago, that we inform just 10 people whom we are associated with that there is this thing called Islamic finance or Islamic banking, and it is good for us as human beings how much impact would we have created just within this moment? Unfortunately, we stick down to two concepts of life, the materialistic or the moral life. For the very pious ones, alhamdulillah, we pray that we all become pious, all right? We stick to the moral concept of life and avoid the aspects of materialism, where materialism starts looking at accumulation, accumulation and, and considering the dunya to be very rosy and very attractive for us, which we have been told to fight ourselves and create that uh, contentment within ourselves. And within that statement, I remember uh, I was listening to one of my lecturers uh, two weeks back, and he said, what is baraka? What is baraka? What is a blessing? Where does it start from? How do we get it? And he said very clearly that a blessing is not wealth, is not more of what you have, is not getting more, but it is being content 
with what you have. It's not about growing, all right, in, in, in any aspect, but being content with what Allah has blessed you with. The moment you start having that, that little of what you will earn will automatically be sufficient to cater for your basic needs. And if you are stuck to your needs, you will grow. Because that will be Allah's blessings unto you. So coming down to the divine plan, what was, what was Allah's plan to think of? I, may, I hope I'm not crossing the line. I pray that I'm not. But uh, let's assume that we as wealth, as accumulated or money brought to us, all right? Was it to be growing or competing or was it a test? It is mentioned in the few ayahs of the Quran. Uh, I believe uh, these presentations will be shared down with you as we are short of time. But it is not, this wealth is not to be created into competition, but more of it as an exam unto us as to how we spend every penny. All these aspects where we look at human beings and Muslims, the five pillars and the like, they, they, they accumulate down to one aspect which we are focusing on today and that is charity. Charity pushes it down to the economic power and the economic system and human welfare. How this, all these individual aspects about funds and money is involved and where it actually ends up in. This is what is trickling down to the economic system. How will this system be triggered further? It will now be associated whether you're doing a good deed or not, or is it your belief? If you're looking at a good deed, the good deed will start off again further with a morality, how good as a moral aspect are you looking at, or your economic system. And when you look at an economic system, you are now going to be trickling it down to either an accumulation or distribution. And this now triggers down to the further aspects of how you have accumulated that wealth. Was it earned or was it considered under the usage side? If it was earned, how was it earned? Was it earned through business or was it earned through riba? And when I say riba, riba is being uh, in my next slide, I'll, I'll explain to you how that differentiation is coming about to be. Is that if you do it in business, yes, or was it earned through riba? And if it was riba, automatically that would be haram. And that trickling down and putting that money earned through riba onto the plate of your children as food, imagine the kind of behavior you will try and create. It is a it is actually a domino effect and not just a one-off transaction. So again, studying that, where does this riba apply and how does it come about to be? If you see that when you look at labor and capital with land being used, machines being used uh, to cultivate, etc., when effort is being used, the main key word is effort. Wherever effort has been used, that automatically becomes an income which is halal. Partnerships where you may not have had a direct input into that effort. Somebody else has done it, but you have contributed through your capital. That has been permitted. While on the contrary, if you look at the two lower uh, items on the barrel, they mention about middlemen, land, and machinery. Machinery is technology today, which we see very clearly about Bitcoin and the like. Okay. And we have middlemen as agents who do not do any effort, all right, and just do link ups, whereby the typical aspects is commercial papers and commercial swaps, which happen in the, uh, in the, in the downfall of the financial system in 2007, 2008, whereby papers were being directed or being sold, just a piece of paper being sold at a price there was no physical transaction or trade happening. Those were the ones which defaulted. And at that point in time even, 
Islamic banks were still standing. Islamic banks are still are there in the U.S. and they're still, uh, they were still standing because they were still stuck to those principles of Sharia. While other banks, which were very large, very huge muscle, they all went down. Lastly is whereby we use the medium of exchange as a commodity on its own. The moment we do that, automatically that triggers riba. So now, when we talk about distribution of wealth, how does it happen and where does it start? There are certain things within this hall, actually we've actually done those things. Uh, I also got married within this same compound and my dowry was also discussed within this same compound. All right, those are certain things which are specific, principled and directed. That law of the land was also putting up taxes, which we are supposed to do so that our facilitations can happen as a life within this country. Zakat is a compulsory divine uh, directive to be happening. That's also compulsory. Eventually, we have voluntary contribution, not dictated by anyone. When we do that, automatically that one, Allah knows best, who is going to give you that reward. For those who do it, Alhamdulillah, eventually we do see that, the benefits that they get. If we also pr practice that, inshallah Allah will also give us that. Here comes the theoretical part. Does Islam allow any banking system? Is it there? It's not there. As we've, this, as we've already heard a few uh, presentations before, that it's a financing system which has been created through trade. It was not there at the Prophet's time, but it has been necessitated to be created because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that it is, that our religion is complete. There are no gaps, there are no shortcuts. There is nothing or there are no fragments remaining. Our religion is complete. So if this is our system, there has to be a reason how that system is included in our Islamic financial system or is in our Islamic system. Interest or riba is against natural laws. And the condition being that if, at an if, the banking system comes down to the interest rate of zero, which has been replicated within the Sharia contracts of Qard, all right, then we are fine. But if we have decided to go ahead with a trade transaction, then the trade transaction will create profitability. So money was actually created as a supportive function. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention the hadith which, or the work here which actually happened. And I believe I picked it up from uh, Sheikh Badru here about the story of Hazrat Bilal bringing in old dates and new dates and uh, the Prophet mentioning that to be riba. The money which was then brought in was to have that medium of exchange, whether to differentiate between old and new so that the profit and the value is given to the rightful people. Using wealth in the real economic sense and also to collect zakat were part of the natural economic system. And business in Islam is not about just trade, but it is also to create it or reflect it as an ibadah as well. So how do we heal from this commercial or financial economic system we are discussing and we are stuck in? Remove your expectations and limit your growth to yourself. And look at yourself as your own well-being. Limit your debts. Stop borrowing according on riba. In fact, if possible, avoid debt at as much as you can. If you can't avoid it, try to use Islamic finance or Islamic banks to now borrow. Start introducing zero-rated debts. Avoid speculation. Purchasing currencies today or purchasing stocks today, speculating that they will grow tomorrow. Avoid that. 
unearned earnings, which means where there is no effort to be taxed. I hope we can put this up in uh, the Islamic Finance Act. I'm sure the taxman will be very happy with that. And uh, reduce labor for energy use, replace labor for energy use. Uh, looking at creating and strengthening social fabric. When I say social fabric, is to continue or create more bond with your blood ties and your brethren, whereby to avoid uh, uh, having more verbal differences, but support each other in every aspect. And look at land, not just for speculation, but either for living or for business. How can we start doing that within our personal level? We will look, try to look at a simpler lifestyle, get out of interest, utilize goods before replacing them. We like to have more than what we need. Try to avoid that, OK? Uh, looking at extravagant, thanks to our social media today, uh, we see high-fi lifestyles, and we want to achieve that. Simplicity is actually the best morality. Most of, I believe, uh, statistics were mentioning that approximately around 70% of the lifestyles being displayed on social media are actually fake. Right? They've been created or photographed just to create those likes and uh, do business with it. So uh, besides that, looking at uh, fashion trend, Fashion and trend is a common uh, trigger amongst economies so that you may be able to purchase more, all right? Or keep on purchasing because after a certain time, the fashion is out. It's a new design, so you need something different. And uh, try and get closer to nature, going to get, get closer to nature in general, land, sea, etc. And uh, Let's join hands with those people who are fighting to get uh, the Islamic Finance Act. We see where we can support them. And inshallah, we'll all be achieving the greater good. Jazakallah khair.